If you have your Bibles, find Luke chapter 19, real quick. We're going to pass some Bibles out. If you don't have one, find your smartphone, find Luke chapter 19. This is our last week. Hey, we need a little lights. I maybe, the computer crashed last time. Did I ask this? You know what? I kept on getting frustrated with a lot because the computer had crashed. All right, we got a little help. Luke chapter 19. This is week six at Lent. We're wrapping up our journey to the cross, and this is our last weekend of our series on the crux. H- have you learned anything in this series? I, I hope you have. I, I got to tell you, when, when we come to the end of a series, to me it's kind of like losing a friend because I've spent so much time studying, and, just, and so it's a little sad for me, but also kind of exciting about the new things. We're getting ready to... Uh, really dive into the Word here, but before we dive in, I I want us to pray because we don't want to hear from a human being. We want to hear from God, so just take a few moments to be in prayer, and I want to invite you. I don't know why you're here tonight, but if you have something you need to say to God, just, just go ahead and say it right now, whatever it is. It may be a thank you. It may be a confession. It might be a petition, but whatever it is, just Take a little time to do your business with God. Do it right now. I want to remind you, that's why we have prayer stations on this Saturday night. We don't have them on Sunday morning, but we have them on Saturday night. Anytime you have business to do with God in the middle of music, in the middle of preaching, in the middle of praying. You just get up out of your seat. Man, if you need to, you just go. You can do it right there where you are, but you can go there too. Just always, this is a time to be with God. Yeah, God, we love the music. We love being with each other, but that's not why we're here. We're here to be in your presence. We're here to be with you. We're here to hear you speak. So God, I pray in this, these next few moments we have together that you will comfort the afflicted and that you will afflict the comfortable. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we claim not only this city, not only this church, not only Joshua and Crowley and Mansfield and Cleburne and Alvarado and Arlington and Fort Worth and and Midlothian and Godly, all these other communities, Father, we claim them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that they belong to you, that you truly are the God of the city. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, this is the church calendar. We call this Palm Sunday or Palm Weekend. And this is the weekend that we celebrate Jesus triumphant. Finally, he's coming into Jerusalem. You heard part of the passage that Judy read earlier. Uh, We're right down here in verses uh, 33 and 34. The people are gathering. He's on this colt. He's going into Jerusalem. People have their palm branches. They're laying down coats. It says right there uh, in verses uh, 35 and 36 and 37 that the crowd of disciples began joyfully to sing and to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Then it says there in the next verse, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Do we have that? Hey, say that with me. Read that. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Leave it there. That's not loud enough. Because look what happens in the next verse. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why? They were being too loud. You're not loud enough. Say it again. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It was electric. It was exciting. It was off the charts. You go down there in the next verse, it says that, listen, if, if you didn't speak, it says the stones will begin to shout. There was this delirium in the city. 
It's kind of like what's going to happen around here when the Texas Rangers finally win the World Series. Amen? I mean, there will be delirium in the city. And if you and I don't speak, the stadium will shout. If you and I don't speak, the seats will begin to clatter whack. Because when something like this happens, God moves in mighty ways. Now, this was supposed to be the climax. You sense the, the building and the building, the high point of Jesus' ministry. Everybody's excited. It's the Passover. The Jewish people are celebrating the exodus. They finally got delivered out of slavery, and then here comes Jesus. Man, he's been performing all these miracles, telling all these great stories. I mean, their hopes are high, fulfilling prophecy. Why, he even comes in Jerusalem on a colt, just like Zechariah said. Everything is like They are ready to crown him king right then and there. But Jesus doesn't seem to be too excited. He's not buying into their enthusiasm. Look down here at what happens at uh, verse uh, 42. He said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Now, what is he saying? He's looking over the city. He's looking over those who were shouting his name. He's saying, you know, guys, I hear what you're saying. You are my disciples, some of you say. You follow me. But you'll be the same ones on Friday. They'll be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then you go on the next two verses in 43 and 44 that Jesus goes out and he casts a judgment, a warning upon Jerusalem. Read them. And here's what he's really saying in those two verses. He is saying that in 40 years, I am going to unleash the power of Rome upon you and the temple will be destroyed. Because you really do not know still who I am. You think you do, but you do not. Now there's one little verse in here that so many people overlook and this is the heart of what I want us to look at tonight. Go back to verse 41. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, what does it say? What did he do? He wept. See, you, 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 can't, you can't separate what you, the cross from the heart of Jesus. You can't separate what you believe about God from the tears of Jesus that drove him to that cross. See, I, I, I want you to know the truth this evening, that it wasn't anger that caused Jesus to go to the cross. It wasn't God's wrath that caused him to go to the cross. It wasn't anger that caused him to march into that town and to go through all he had been through. It was tears. He wept. In fact, in your notes, it was compassion. The compassion of God for people who still didn't get it. <coughs> See, we have a God who, who doesn't stand with his arms crossed from a distance and just watches everything that goes on. He has compassion and cares for you and me. And, and this is not just right here. I mean, if you've read the Bible, you've heard stories like this. Over in John chapter 11, there's a great little story where one of Jesus' very best friends dies. His name is Lazarus. And what's interesting in that story, close to, I guess it's almost five times in some way you can interpret where Jesus said, listen, Lazarus, I know y'all think he's dead, he's, died, he's sick, but he's going to be okay. I know you think he's dead, he's died, but, but he's going to be okay. Over and over and over, and then when he gets there, okay, he finally gets there on the scene, and Lazarus is dead. And everybody's in tears, everybody's crying, everybody's suffering. Jesus walks on the scene. Now, here's what he doesn't do. 
He doesn't say, listen, I told you a hundred times he's going to be okay. What's all the drama about? He didn't say, I told you, I know. Don't worry about it. See, Jesus knew that Lazarus was going to be okay. But still, in that story, you get the shortest verse in the Bible, two words. It says, Jesus wept. Why did he cry? Compassion for the people who were hurting, who were grieving, who were mourning. You know, I remember it like it was yesterday because I'm looking right at the man who made the phone call, and Gary, you know, but Gary Killen, you remember the day that you called me from the ski lift? Dallas and I had just gotten back from, from the youth ski trip. We just made a long drive from Angel Fire, got back into our house. We hadn't been there 30 minutes after making that long drive. And the phone calls, and it's Gary Killen. He's sitting right back there. He said, Rick, I hate to tell you this, but your son James, he's been in an accident. Man, I want to tell you, I think he's hurt pretty bad. We've got the paramedics here. Instantly, my heart goes boom. Fear, worry. It's not too long after that, we're talking again. He said, man, the care flight's here. They don't want to take him to the local hospital. It's pretty, it looks like they're serious. They're taking him to Albuquerque. Boom, boom, fear, worry. Here we are, way, and our son's way over here, our baby. We're making all these plans, trying to find private planes that we can get anything to get us to Albuquerque. We got to be with our kid. And then nothing was working. Finally, we got Southwest Airlines, and they scooted us on. They forced a way for us to get there. So we're walking down finally, just about two hours later, we're getting on a plane over at Love Field. As we're walking up, the doctor calls me. She says, Mr. Owen, yes, listen, I'm the doctor that's attending to your son, James. I want you to know he's going to be okay. I said, are you sure? Yes. I was so thankful for that phone call. Man, we got on that plane. We hooked him to Albuquerque. Somebody picked us up, rushed us to the hospital, and we walked in, and I knew he was going to be okay. I had no doubt he was okay. But when I walked into that room, and oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Turn on my mic for a second, please. I'm good. <laughs> when we walked into that room and James was sitting in that chair, his face all swollen and already banged up in blood, I felt the pain, and I just wanted to get in that chair. And I wanted to be the one suffering. Any parent know what I'm talking about. Any parent have a clue. You, you know what I mean, right? You feel the pain. Hey, listen, we put braces on James. When mom said, hey, we're going to put braces on him, I said, no, you're not going to put braces on that kid. How come? Because they're going to hurt. I don't want him to hurt. I'm sorry, honey, he needs braces. No, I couldn't stand it. Every time they tighten those things, my own teeth hurt. You know what I'm talking about? If you, who are sinful and evil, feel that for your children, how much more so God? See, God has compassion. See, in your notes, God feels the pain. He feels our hurts. Let me show you how this works. Go, go over to hold your place there in, in Luke 19. We may or may not come back. It depends on how excited I get. <laughs> go, over to, go to Psalm 34. Go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I want you to underline a verse in your Bible. Some of you need to underline this and go back to it. I know some of you are hurting. Some of you need to hear this tonight. We got some people tonight that God is weeping over. God is looking at the city and he sees your life and you don't even know it, but God is crying. You know that hell that came down this morning? Those were the tears of God frozen in midair for his people that are hurting. Look what it says. The Lord is, close, verse, uh, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Somebody needs to underline this. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. I was visiting with a friend of mine who's coming up on a year anniversary of going through just literal hell on earth, he and his whole family. 
he said something kind of strange. He said, Rick, I know you think I'm going to be standing weird here to you because you walked with us. You know exactly what we went through. But uh, I have no desire to kind of go back and do it again. I have no desire to go back through what I, my wife and I and we put our kids through. But I got to tell you, I kind of miss a little bit of some of those dark moments because in those dark moments, that's when I felt the closest to God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? What does it say in the psalm? Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? You are with me. And death comes in more ways than just physical death, my friends. Your rod and your staff, they what? Comfort me. Anybody here have a broken heart? Anybody here tonight feel crushed in spirit? You are a candidate for an encounter with God who draws close to his people who are hurting. Not, not only has God feel our pain, he, in your notes, he suffers for us. Let me show you this. Go to your right. Find Isaiah 53. Go to your right. You're going to go through the Psalms. You're going to go through Proverbs. You're going to go through Ecclesiastes. You're going to go through the Song of Solomon. Then finally, you're going to get to Isaiah, one of the longest blooming books in the whole Bible. Man, he was long-winded. He, he, he was more long-winded than I am. Look right there. Isaiah, find verse 5 and 53. Verse 5 and 53. He suffers for us, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He, Jesus, was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Our God, our God, our God chooses to come to the earth and he would come as flesh and blood and he would hang upon this cross. And you and I hiding on the earth, a sinful, a broken people, picture the cross suspended in the middle of the air, in the sky, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself upon it. And the consequences of our sin and our brokenness, the back of God, the back of Jesus himself, taking it, taking it, taking it, that you and I, might be protected. My dad told me here uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, he was sitting at his table having breakfast and the rain began to fall down in the torrent and there's a little nest of baby birds that have been watching outside, right, right outside their kitchen window. And the little baby birds are right there. In the, and when the rain came, torrential downpour, the mother swooped in and spread her wings chooses to do that for you and me on the cross to protect us from the consequences of our sin. Whoa, the compassion of God for his people. And Jesus walked into the city and he wept. Now, when you experience this compassion of God, the grace of God that we talked about last week. You, you can't stay the same. Go over to your right. Go to the New Testament. Find the 2 Corinthians. Find 2 Corinthians. Find chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Find chapter 3, the very last verse. I'll wait a second or two. Once you experience the compassion of God, and you know the cross, the crux, look what happens. Very last verse, verse 18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. In other words, that when you come face to face with the compassion of God and you experience the goodness of God on the cross, your face it changes you begin to reflect the goodness of God, and all of a sudden you become transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, which, who is the Spirit. 
After Easter, we're going to talk about the spirit life. See, you don't even know it. We talked about God the Father for the first few weeks to, of the year. We had the Modern Family Series about the love of God, God the Father. Now we've been in God, God the Son, and now we're going to go into God the Spirit right after Easter. And it says the, trans, the, the Holy Spirit at the cross, it says in your notes, it, we become transformed. The cross calls us to be transformed. Now, I'm gonna put this in a term that I think most people in this room can understand. And if you can't understand this because of your personal experience, you can understand it because you've observed it in others. Becoming a believer and a disciple of Jesus, it's kind of like becoming a parent. It changes everything. I remember when Dallas and I were married, we kind of made this a pact with each other that before we had kids, even after we had kids, we were not going to become mainline establishment sort of people. We were not going to become part of the status quo. quo. We were going to stay cool, edgy, and hip. And one day our kids would be proud that we did. And we made a covenant that we were not going to cave in and that we would never, ever, ever, ever buy a minivan. We had two. We named them both. One was the Galloping Gray Ghost. The other one was the Back Beast. Those two minivans are legendary, not only in our family, but in the Burleson community. I could tell you things those vans could do. You would not believe me. Now, I want a little booyah from anybody who's ever been a part of the minivan culture. A little booyah. Don't be ashamed. It happens to all of us. And all of a sudden, you're like everybody else, right? I mean, one minute I'm driving a T-Bird. I'm cool. The next minute I'm driving a minivan. Kids, kids ruin you. I mean, they change everything, right? One minute you're watching ESPN and shoot them up bang bangs, the next minute it's Barney. <laughs> I love you, you love me, right? Big Bird, the Smurfs. And that's before the kids get up on Saturday morning, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, you find yourself all of a sudden, what, what's happened to me? What's, what's going on? I mean, just, and it's not just when they're young, when they get older. Two summers ago, James, I knew he was, he was about gonna, it's our baby. He, it was probably gonna be his last summer home, and I'm trying to spend as much time with him as I can, and he's sitting there watching the show. I said, what are you watching, son? He's watching Teen Wolf. So I sat down, I'm watching Teen Wolf. Once a week, I'll tell you, what am I, I'm watching Teen Wolf. Well, the very next summer, James is not at home. He's working in Midland, out in the oil field. He's going to be a petroleum engineer. But guess what? I watched that summer while he was gone. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you it was because I, I felt closer to him while he was there. And I'll just tell you that's why it was. It may not be the truth, <laughs> but that's my story. You see, you see, when you become a parent, it changes your life. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, there's a total change. When you become a disciple, you're not the same person. I will tell you, I'm not the same person that I used to be. See, some of you don't know, 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 there's a lot of things you don't, as much as you do know, there's a lot of things you don't know about me. I'm a very sensitive person. My feelings get hurt pretty easy. And so in the early part of my ministry, I spent a lot of time making sure everybody in the church house was happy because I didn't want anybody to be happy, to be unhappy. Guess what? I really don't care anymore. I used to think it was my job to get everybody on the happy train and to keep it. Hey, listen, you're welcome to be on the train, but if you're not happy, get off. <laughs> there are other trains. 
But this train has a mission and a purpose, and we're going to follow Jesus. And if you don't want to follow what the Word of God says and be that tough and that, that discipline of what the Word of God says and the mission, hey, there are other trains. I finally, see, God is working on me. I'm not the same person I used to be. What about you? Hey, I used to be highly competitive. <laughs> now, I'm not nearly as competitive as I used to be. See, because you used to do, I would do everything I could to beat you, and I would really enjoy letting you know about it. I'm just telling you the truth. I hate to lose. I've never lost anything on purpose to my boys, even when they were six weeks old. <laughs> I'm a broken person, okay? See, that's why I'm not dying anytime soon. Because if I get to heaven now, I'm still going to stink the place up. God is still changing me. But I'm not as competitive as I used to be. There are some things that just don't matter anymore. What about you? See, when, when, you, when you experience the compassion of Jesus Christ upon the cross, it begins to change you. And if there's no change going on, see, in your notes, just reading of the scripture, we're going to go back with just one page. It causes, when you begin to change, you were called to demonstrate, the cross causes to demonstrate the compassion of God to the world. It changes us. Let me show you. Go back to your left, uh, one chapter from 2 Corinthians. Go to chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. Now, you see, I'm preaching as long as I want tonight because tomorrow I can't. Are you, are you with me? Okay, yep. making sure. Because this is going on the video. This is going on the, on the website. So we've got to do this. Look at verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Are you, are you reading the same thing I'm reading? Now, the next two words are so that. Now, in my Bible, every time I see so that, I circle it every single time because God gives something so that we give it on to somebody else. It's critical. Whenever you see so that, you stop. God, what are you doing? So the Father of comfort and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that... We can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. You see, the longer you follow Jesus, the more you become transformed into a disciple, the more you begin to care about what God cares about the more you begin to think about what God thinks about, the more your heart begins to break for the things that break God's heart. And it changes how you interact with people. It changes how you influence people. Because you are aware that because you are a Christian, a disciple, People expect you to be the visible demonstration of God's compassion on earth for his people. There's a lot of compassion needed in our city. Did you know that in Parker and Tarrant County, one out of every four children go to bed hungry? One out of every four in Tarrant and Parker counties. Did you know that? Did you know that in Johnson County, one out of every six children go to bed hungry? hungry every single night. That's over 200,000 children in three counties right here in our southwest portion that go to bed at night hungry. Did you know that the unemployment rate in Johnson County is 7.6%? That is a little over 11,000 kids, 11,000 families don't have income and they want work. I've gone down to the Harvest House and asked, tell me, the people that come into the Harvest House and asking for food, are they just looking for entitlements? Tell me, what are they looking for? She said, no, 
They're looking for work. They want to work. They want to earn. They want to make a difference with their own hands. I see one of our local school board members here on Mike. I know you can verify this, that, that man, what's happening in our, in our state with, with financing, it's really putting the hurt on local schools and more importantly on the teachers in the classroom. Is that true, Mike? I mean, that's, and that's happened out here in our own community, and I know it's happening all around us. And here's what's happening, church. You need to know this. We have more and more kids that are moving through the system, and they get out, and they can't read, and they can't write. Did you know that? If they can't read and they can't write, they can't get a job. Because the classrooms are so big, and a lot of parents don't care, or the parents can't read or write. Now, some of the stuff I just shared with you is happening in our own community. Now, I know this happens all over. It's not, we're not just a black hole, but this is in our own backyard. This is in our own city, our own community. And my question is for you, do you care for what God cares about? Because the scripture says that Jesus wept over the city. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't say yes to this Jesus thing just to come to church on the weekend and have a little kumbaya experience. I came to be a follower of Jesus Christ because I believe he is who he said he is. And he has said that the church is the hope in a broken world, and that's you and me. That's us. And he requires us to get involved, to have compassion. Let me give you two things here. Because compassion requires two things if we're going to do this. N- number one, it requires geographical and relational proximity. I, I, I love this. Go read later on your own the Message Bible. Read John 1.1, 1, 1, the Message Bible, and it goes like this. God became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. I love that. God left the perfection of heaven put on flesh and blood, and he moves in. God does not stand at a distance with his arms crossed and going, hmm, I should hope those people make it. I'm going to pray for them. Oh, I'm thinking about them. God puts on flesh and blood and moves in to the neighborhood. Are you involved in your neighborhood? Do you know what's going on in the community in which you live? You see, I can throw the numbers out that I just threw out to you, and they kind of bounce off of you. You say, well, those are just numbers. Those numbers are people. Those numbers are families. Those numbers are parents. Those numbers are children. Just like the ones sitting around here and right down the hallway. Children. And it's so easy for you and me to kind of insulate ourselves and kind of step back. Oh, those are, I, I, I can't do this or I can't. Oh, somebody else will take care of that. Somebody else. And we just kind of sit back and kind of watch. And we give all these excuses, but that's all they are. They're excuses. Let me ask you. What would it look like for you to take a step to be involved in the community wherever you live? In the community. But it's not just geographic, it's also relational. Every one of us in this room is surrounded by people that are hard to love, amen? Some of them are sitting right next to you right now, I know that. I I saw somebody in the back went to the person next to them. They're praying for you right now. I mean, just face it. Can we just say this, be honest? Some people are crazy. I mean, they're just blooming nuts. I mean, and it's just, I mean they, am I telling the truth? Hey, please, don't, 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 don't come here unless you want the truth. All right, we're just going to speak the flat-out gospel. People are just, they're hard to, I mean, some of them are your neighbors. I mean, right? Some of your coworkers. 
Oh, some of them, it's a friend of a friend. You know, hey, I want to be your friend, but man, I'm not going to be your friend's friend. I mean, no way. Uh-uh. You got them all to yourself. Or maybe it's your own kids. Don't enjoy that too much. <laughs> you do have to go home together. Remember that. But what would happen if these people that are so hard to love, if you really got to know them and you knew their story, you knew what they'd been through, discover why they are the way they are. I want to tell you something. If you know Jesus and you know somebody's story, it'll change your heart about that person. What would it look like for you, for you, for you, to get closer to some people that are so hard to love, to really just kind of, to know their story. See, isn't that what God does? We pray, we pray, and he knows everything about us. Every stinking, unlovable, crazy, idiotic thing about us, and he still left heaven to come to earth to move into the neighborhood. These drama people. So it's gonna require that. Next thing it's gonna require, it's gonna require passion. It's going to require passion. Passion is more than I'll pray for you, although prayers are nice. Passion is more than warm well wishes. It's more than a little card, a little email. Passion and compassion go together. In fact, passion comes out of the word compassion. The first time the word passion was ever used for what happened to Jesus on the cross. What was the name of the movie? The Passion of the Christ. That's the first time that word is ever used. Did you realize that? That Jesus on the cross as he suffered passionately weeping for his people. See, that's why you can't wear a cross as jewelry. That's why you can't wear a cross on your body as a tattoo just for the grins. That's why you can't wear clothing that has a cross on it unless you know what it means and you want to stand up for what it symbolizes, the passion and the sufferings of Christ. Because people think when you wear that cross that you're following Jesus. And he said, take up your cross and follow me, which means that you're willing to sacrifice your wants, your desires for the well-being of other people because that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. Do we understand? A passion to sacrifice for the well-being of others. Now, one of the things I love about this church is that you are passionate. Thanks be to God. I love being a part of you. Thank you for letting me be a part of you. Every Christmas, I'm just blown away by your generous outpouring miracle birthday gift to Jesus. I'm going to be going to Ethiopia here in about three weeks, I guess four weeks now. I'm going to bring back pictures of the hostel that you are building, giving these young girls a chance because the, the global community, that's really in our backyard now. Ethiopia, that's our backyard, too. And I'm going to bring back pictures going into the bush where people have not been before, and we're going to share the good news of Jesus in communities that haven't heard about Jesus, and we're going to shore up some pastors who are fending off the violent Muslim terrorists in the bowels of Africa. We're going to come back and tell you stories. And while I'm doing that, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be doing Change the World Weekend, the last weekend of April. You're going to be spreading out here in our own backyard. It's amazing. You're an incredible people. What happens on Sunday night? You may tell me, what happens every Sunday night at this church? Celebrate recovery. You know what happened? Because one person had a passion that people who 
had habits, helps, and hang-ups, needed a Christ-centered 12-step program. And so now, Celebrate Recovery, and everybody comes. And we know what Cars for Christ is? And we know what Cars for Christ is? That's when you, when you trade in your car, instead of trading it in, you give it to the church. And we put it in somebody's hands who has a job but has no transportation. I got another letter this past week from someone. Thank you for the van. Without the van, I would have lost my job. That's passion. You got it. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, God, for such a passionate body of Christ. But let me ask you, just because you're a part of this wonderful body that's doing so many passionate things in the community, what about you? Are you personally sacrificing? What about you? Are you involved? Are you sitting and just watching? At this church, I want you to know, it's not a spectator place. There's another train you can get on. But in this train, we all have a role sacrifice because of what Jesus did on the cross for each and every single one of us to take up your cross. That's why tomorrow afternoon we're having an Easter egg hunt. There'll be over 2,000 people here, most of them children, who will never come in the doors of this church. Why? So they can know the joy of being a part of a, a wholesome, uplifting community. That's why our, our journey to the cross on Friday is not just for us. The community, you can be amazed at the community that will come. And then Easter next weekend. Some of you cannot sit where you're sitting tonight. I want to ask you to close in and sit at the front so all the guests can sneak in and sit at the back because guests don't want to come sit up here. Do not have this front row empty next week or this one empty. When you come in, some of you come sit up front and leave the back for the guests so they feel less conspicuous. Are you listening? Because it's not about you and me. It's about those who don't know Jesus, who are not a part of a church family. That's taking up your cross. Sacrifice for the well-being of others. And that's why tomorrow, you've already been to church. Band, come on up. Band, come on up. That's why tomorrow, after worship, 500 people, 500 people, 12, 15, and we're going to circle one big swoop. We've measured it out. The ark through the hallway, around the sanctuary, through the hallway, and we're going to pray over what God is going to do here on Easter weekend because we are going to claim in the name of Jesus Christ this southwest portion of the Metroplex for Jesus because you're going to invite and invite and invite. Because you know, people don't need resources. Our community doesn't need a lot of empathy. You know what they need? They need Jesus. And they need you and me to be the visible demonstration that God cares and God loves them and God's going to get involved. And who's going to make sure they know that? So we start with prayer Easter tomorrow, 1215, right here. Please, I want you to be thinking, if I don't show up, there'll only be 499. 